Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 77, Miniature Games Without the Minis, sorta. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, with the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put your years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, tonight we've got someone who was a longtime miniature gamer who's looking to get back to the table, but it's looking for games where they don't have to collect, build, and paint a whole army. I've also got a preview, review, preview, a prototype, whatever you want to call it. It's not a published game, an abstract strategy game called Gorinto. That's going to be launching next week on Kickstarter, or tomorrow if you're listening to this on the podcast. And I've also got a couple new expansions to the table for the Bellhops tabletop. One for uh, Horizons and one for Orléans. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Our first comment is from our rather popular Gloomhaven FAQ. Betcha Mini says, thanks for making this. It's been useful. Just to clarify one point, when drawing with advantage-disadvantage at 2632, where there is amb ambiguity, the first card drawn is used. It's not decided by the player. Thanks, Becca, Betcha, Mini. Um, I thought we figured that out. Like, I swear we went through and reading that bit and talking about it and getting it wrong, but then getting further and finding a different definition of ambiguous and that correcting it and scrolling back up, but maybe not. I Maybe not. Because I know in some situations, like whenever it's ambiguous, it's the player's choice. Where in this case, it's not actually ambiguous. I thought we moved back and went back. But either way, um, even if we did correct it later, it is a problem where it happened. The problem is we haven't found a good way to put this in the video. So I used to watch, um, I don't know, like, like YouTube used to have like pop-up video where people could put stuff on top. They seem to have pulled that out. So I can't find a way for us to redo this without re-uploading the whole thing, which we don't want to do because it's got a ton of views. We don't want to touch that at all. So if someone out there has more YouTube experience than us and knows a way to like pop up something or put some text on the screen or just something to correct it, we would love to hear how. Absolutely. And next, a comment from Mark Spector from Grand Gamers Guild. Mark has a word game suggestion, Palabra, a little known gem. Well, thanks for the suggestion, Mark. Uh, we'll toss that in the show notes, though I don't know if anyone's going to be able to find this one. I had to look this up myself, hadn't heard of it, came out in 1990. I am not seeing any copies on any of the usual places I shop online. I got to say it looks cool because it's a step up from normal building, word building games where you have cards with letters, but they're also color coded and you get bonus points if you can spell words with all one color and there's some set collection there. There's some neat stuff going on. It does look like a cool game. Interesting. Well, we have a comment on our two-player date night article. Cindy M. writes, Some of my favorites to carry around are Mr. Jack, Mystery Rummy, Escape from Alcatraz, Ramen Fury, and Kaching. That list starts with the intense, longer play games and descends to the faster, funnier games. Great list. Thanks. Well, thanks on more suggestions, uh, more game suggestions, Cindy. I gotta say, I'm impressed, because here Cindy lists off, what, five games? That's five games I've never actually tried. That doesn't happen often at all. I haven't tried any of those. They're probably all great. Couldn't tell you myself. What we will do is make sure we throw those in the show notes so other people can check them out. Now, our final comment comes from Emmett O'Brien and is based on one of our AMA topics from last week. What to do when social interactions take over and you want to get people to focus on the game. Now, this wouldn't be right for a lot of groups, but in an old group I was in, we had the Tangent Monster. If anyone noticed the group going off to a uh, social tangent not related to the game, they could silently put their hand up to their forehead, thumb and pointer finger extended, and pointing down to make a clumsy T. Anyone who noticed would do the same, and the last person to put their hand up lost. 
Losing back then meant eating a Dorito from a bag that had been left in the corner of the room for months, possibly years. I would advise against that kind of thing these days. Nobody ever got sick, but that would definitely derail your next game session if someone got a stomach bug. These days, I'd come up with a less dangerous consequence. <laughs> Wow, uh, I love this comment. Uh, what's funny about this is we actually have something similar we used to do uh, at our games. This goes back to my uh, fourth edition D&D &D games. So not all that long ago, uh, we had a bag of bananas. You know, those little, I don't even know, they're like marshmallow bananas that smell really strong of banana. We call them bananas. I don't think that's the actual brand. These were so old and stale, they were basically little yellow banana-shaped rocks, and we would drop them on the table with a thud. And as punishment for various transgressions, players would have to eat a banana. Now, we never did it for people getting off topic, though. It was for other things, like if you rolled a botch and there was some other stuff, if you forgot your dice and so on. Now, I do dig the Emmett O'Brien thing here. I, I like the signal. I like the idea of that, actually. It's a really cool concept. Um, reminds me of some of the safety tools, like the OK check-in. But something you can signal just to say, hey, you're getting off topic. Get back to the game. I think that would be actually a really cool table rule, something, something to have to be able to be like, just as a heads up, like you realize you talking about Star Wars is bothering people, and once you notice a couple other people it's bothering, maybe it's time to stop talking about Star Wars. I do dig that. I, I like the concept of that. Yeah. I actually had a teacher uh, in university who appointed a tangent monitor, monitor in each class mm -hmm. who was responsible for putting an end to the endless tales that that teacher would spin if allowed to speak freely. Uh, <laughs> he'd just, we'd get off, he'd start telling us about something. He was actually a carpentry teacher, and he'd veer off into some story about some event adventure he'd had in carpentry in the theater. And eventually it would get boring enough and we realized we weren't actually learning anything. And the tangent monitor would, would reel him in and we'd get back to the topic at hand. Uh, That's fair. Yep. Whatever works, right? Like, Absolutely. no, I dig it. Like, I, I don't know. We, we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago now, three weeks ago now, where we talked about table contracts. And I'm like, That's a cool one that I think would be a, a neat one to have on the list. Yep. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here at Twitch. On, we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell. I got a box to open tonight, so for those of you in the chat room, feel free to stick around. Ooh. Little things are going to happen here. Or I just is still on it. I'm gonna have to give this. Get a, a nice, actually surprisingly heavy box. They did try. They tried. Didn't work, but they tried. Uh, unfortunately, that needs to be on the customs form. So U.S. companies, if you are sending boxes to Canada, that information needs to be on your customs form, please. So yeah, we got a box to open. Once we get to the announcement section, you'll know what's in there. Uh, I am not gonna open what's inside the box, but I do have to do an unboxing by the end of the week if I want to get this. But although actually. I, no, yeah, sometime. About to do an unboxing video for that. Right. Uh, so that's Ryan a reason was to stick asking, uh, Escape from Alcatraz, is that the game where one player has to end up as the scapegoat? My understanding is no, it is a co-op game. Only three people have to escape. So I suppose one person can sort of throw themselves on, the, throw themselves on uh, to the dogs or whatever, however mm -hmm. it works. Um, but uh, it is described as a co-op where at least three players must escape in order to win as a co as the team. See, the one I thought of was Escape from Colditz, which is um, an Osprey game, but I don't know how many of that plays. That's two to six players, so that wouldn't be... Unless maybe that also has that mechanic. Yeah, like I said, all those games, like, I've seen the names before, but I haven't played. I know Mr. Jack is a Jack the Ripper. It's a hidden movement. One player hides while the other players try to catch. Which I I'm not a huge fan of those style of games. I've never been a Scotland Yard fan. I've never I didn't like. I can I again I had a, a problem with this name last week or two weeks ago too. Whatever the Fantasy Flight one is that I can never remember the name of. Psyops, Specter Ops, Specter Ops. Got it. Took a bit. Specter Ops, same deal. I don't I, I don't know why. I've never really enjoyed those. Uh, Fury of Dracula being another example. Oh, so hold I have So Mystery Rummy Escape from Alcatraz is one game. Oh, that's one game. Okay. Yes. So it's All actually right, Mystery Rummy, Escape from Alcatraz. On, I was only stumped on four games. I feel better. <laughs> all right. I just, all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a second. I got, as I was typing it into the uh, that, that the BGG search, if you, in yeah. certain places, the BGG search actually works at like Sometimes. Google and gives you. The, the best place the BGG search works is Google and put BGG in next to your search. Yeah. But, well, uh, 
Many times, yes. But it, it, there are times now when it's the the actual. It's gotten better yes. in the purple in the purple bar. It worked. Uh, there yeah. are other times when you do it, it won't. But ah, there they're supposed to be good. I'd never heard about that. Yes, there is a box to open. The answer was other, in the other room. And then by the you you'll get a very very strong hint <laughs> by the time we get to the announcement section. Yep. I know I know what it is. What they are, I guess, yep. is probably a better way to word it. There's no surprises this time, but I enjoy opening the boxes. It's amusing. All right, so tonight, um, interesting topic. I have no idea if the lobby is going to have any experience with these kind of games, but what we're looking at is you got Miniature Gamer, who used to do it all, collect the armies, paint, and build. Actually, the question comes from a friend of a friend, but still, who wants to get back to playing tabletop games but doesn't want that level of dedication. So we're going to have some suggestions for starting off direct suggestions, just hey, here's the type of miniature game you want, here's what you're into, here's some games we think you'll dig, to kind of spreading it out to the whole miniature gaming hobby. So if you've got any suggestions for miniature gaming on the cheap, maybe that might have been a better episode name, though none of it's really cheap. No. But yeah, miniature, miniature <laughs> games without the miniatures is what I wanted to say, but then we do recommend some that have some miniatures, but no army building, no massive, none of, well, you guys can't see this, but none of this. None of that up there. None of that mess. Although I do have a suggestion in there that's got 200 minis for $60. Yeah, there is that. We, we <laughs> Sean and I were debating that, actually. That's uh, Maybe that's our after-show topic. The, the, the value of miniatures over time and what should have happened yep. and what did happen. That actually might be a really good after-show topic. Yeah. All right, are we ready to get going? Yeah, I'm good. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on ask the bellhop uh, social media works too we're everywhere as tabletop bellhop one word now the best ways for questions come through the website because that way they get logged nice and simple and they don't get missed because sometimes social media stuff just flies by i'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere so first up before we get to the question i do want to thank our patreon backers at our new hotel guest level or higher uh, this is something new we launched a couple days ago, and one of the rewards they get is they get to vote on what topic we talk about. So this is our first ever patron pick topic of the show. So thank you, hotel guests. All right, well, tonight we've got a question from Rob Day, who asks, I have a co-worker who used to play mini war games when he was a younger man. He's specifically into historical tanks and looking at getting back to the table. Are there any good strategic board games that might scratch that itch without requiring him to dive fully back into collecting a whole army of miniatures? All right, thanks for the question, Rob. I do wonder if this is Boo Day RPG. If Rob Day, just the day carryover, I could be way off. It is. Thanks for the question, Boo Day. So I'm pleased to say there are a few options out there. Now, miniature gaming is still going strong. And I got to say, it may be cheaper than you think to get into nowadays. There, there are definitely alternatives. There are some great tabletop alternatives to the full army building hobby miniature game. Now, one thing I should, we should say up front is that neither of us are historical war gamers. Uh, I find it's a very niche market. And there is likely some very detailed information out there in the depths of the forums and groups and, and Twitter hashtags that these people use that we're not privy to. They're probably still on Usenet. <laughs> that being said, we both did our research on this one to try and find ways that the Rob, Rob's co-worker can whet his appetite. So one of the war gaming series I actually do play and do enjoy. This is pretty much, I, I like the block series from Columbia Games. That's, that's, I didn't include that in this. So, but uh, is the Command and Color system from designer Richard Borg. Uh, he's produced a lot of different games. I think the first was Gettysburg, which was the American Civil War, and he's gone on to do as much as giant robot mech battles. Uh, the system combines card-driven movement, where you get a bunch of command cards and you move units on either the ref right flank, left flank, or middle, or all over. It actually has the whole flanking system, and dice-driven combat. And the way the commands is the cards, the colors are the dice are color-coded, and so are the units, so you need a green roll on your die to kill a green unit. That's the big, really distilled down and in color system. Now, the one I want to point out here that I think may be good for Rob's co-worker is Memoir 44. This is a World War II-based war game using a simplified version of the CNC system. And I would say overall, and others agree, that this is the best entry point to CNC. It's the most distilled down, most basic, quickest to play, simplest version. 
Now, to me, I actually found it a little too simple, but this game has a ridiculous number of expansions to up that complexity and get to that big war game feel. Now, this does have miniatures, which is why we had our miniatures sort of. So, but there's no hobby aspect. These aren't miniatures you have to assemble. There's no painting. There's no sprues. There's no clipping. They're basically board game pieces. So they could be cubes instead. They're minis. You just put, take them out, pick and play, pick up and play. Uh, my first is actually rather similar. Uh, so an accessible but really quick light war game is Axis and Allies 1941. But if you are concerned, it might be a bit too light. You know, you've got those those old war game jeans in there and you're ready to just slog on. You can jump right into the 1942 edition, which is the full game and yeah. uh, about four hours of play rather than the two hour lighter game of the 1941. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the 42 is actually the original Avalon Hill edition, yeah. the big box game yeah, that yeah. my 42, dad had. 42 is the full big on yeah. Axis and Allies. Whereas 1941 is actually one of the most accessible games for price too it is ridiculously yeah cheap. no it's 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 a low price it's a reduced rule set and it's a quick play but if you really just want to whet your appetite and get a game get a war game out every once in a while mm -hmm. it could be the choice for you all right next game that came to mind specifically addresses the fact that rob's co-worker likes tanks there is a series of games simply enough called tanks t-a-n-k-s that's it tanks there's a series of games put out by Gale Force 9. They're in small packages, small boxes. They can't be that expensive. To be honest, I didn't double check the price. Each set features two comparable tanks and a battlefield for them to fight on. And it's meant to match up, uh, historically is probably the wrong term, but fairly accurately the comparison of the two tanks and how they match up against each other. Now, this is a miniature game. This is, you have a tank miniature, you have it on a sprue, you gotta take it apart, you gotta glue it together, you might wanna paint it, but you're only getting two minis. Like, there's no army collecting, there's no checking through army lists or anything else. It's go pick up a pack of tanks, get two tanks. And yes, you can go buy another pack of tanks and get more tanks, but you're never gonna fill up like a four by four table full of tanks with this game. All right, well, sticking specifically with tanks, I'm gonna offer something a little on the different side. This is Tank Duel, Enemy in the Crosshairs. Now, this is a card game representation of tank-to-tank -tank battles on the Eastern Front of World War II. And they claim, again, I haven't played this game, but uh, I, I was looking into these things a lot, and they claim that they convey the urgency and claustrophobia of the experience. Uh, and what, I, what really caught my eye on this game was going through the ratings the volume of ratings that specifically call out both how accurate the data is and how tank lovers love this game. So, given that uh, you mentioned your friend was a lover of tanks, this could be something they really enjoy. All right, on my side, ditching the minis now. So, getting away from the industry games, there are a ton of Hex Encounter war games out there. That's pretty much when I say war game, most people picture Hex Encounter games. Actually, I wonder if a newer generation of people picture miniatures now, but anyone says war game to me, I picture a big hex map with a bunch of counters on it. Um, there are probably a war game for every miniature battle that's ever happened over the entire world at this point. Uh, they are definitely a subgenre of game, and there are tons of them. So what I did is I did some research on board game geeks, specifically looking for tank battles that would apply here, and the strongest suggestion seems to be, based on what I'm, I'm seeing, is tank on tank, East Front. This is published by Lock and Load Publishing. I will admit I did not find this quickly available to sell for sale. Um, you might be able to get it at Lock and Load, but this isn't something you're going to find at Amazon. But what I liked about this is it's like 45 minutes to an hour and still rates extremely well on Board Game Geek. Yeah, and uh, and there is also a Western Front, but I guess you noticed that it was low. It was rated. Yeah, a it was a lower, lower rating, not a huge amount, but enough. Yeah. So another hex and card driven one would be Combat Commander which has a long list of versions, but the Europe version is still currently in print mm -hmm. uh, and seems to play within that two to three hour range. I've actually got that one on my pile of shame. I don't know if I'll ever get to it, but it's on my pile of shame. It's the one I'm like, you know what? I hear it's one of the best, right? Hex Encounter yeah. game. So I'm like, if I'm going to try a Hex Encounter game and I don't want to go to Advanced Squad Leader, maybe I'll try this. Now, speaking of Advanced Squad Leader level games, if you want something heavier and longer, much, much longer than these other games, like, we're looking at a minimum playtime of 300 minutes. Um, GMT games is probably where you want to look. And for tanks, nothing is rated better than a game called Panzer. 
And what's interesting about this is this is another game my dad had. My dad was into wargaming. He had the old, I don't know if it was Avalon Hill, but it was one of those bookshelf games. I'm pretty sure it was Avalon Hill. And this is a modern updating of the game that, based on the reviews, really fixed all the problems it had with it and is still one of the best hex games. Now, another one, if you really want to push it, is MBT. No, I don't know what that stands for. I probably should have looked it up. This is from GMT Games. This is even heavier and even longer than Panzer. It's pretty much like if you really want to deep dive and play a simulation, that might be what you're looking for. Right. Well, my next suggestion was just about to be a six to eight hour <laughs> hex simulation that seems to really resonate in the gaming community on BGG. But it turns out as I was about to do it, it's out of print. So instead, yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you over to Multiman Publishing, multimanpublishing.com, which has a huge number of options for heavy, miniature-less, historical hex games. And they'll tell you what's in print and not in, and out of print currently. Now, Ooh. they're also currently publishing Advanced Squad Leader. Now, I'm not quite sure how they got the license from Avalon Hill or what all that is, no. but they are not only the home for some of these other tank games, they are the home of advanced squad leader so i think you can guess that they're probably pretty well versed in how to do a hex game all right i got one more hex encounter one uh this is band of brothers ghost panzer again we're tying the tanks right in here i grabbed this because this is pretty much the mid weight this is between the 45 minute tank on tank and the gmt two hour games plays about an hour and a half and its weight is like two and a half under under two and a half so you know, race for the galaxy level of weight, which we like to consider our bare minimum, a little below the minimum on, on weight scale. All right, well, let's say Rob's friend changes his mind and does actually want to get back into collecting armies, painting miniatures. We've got a couple of mo solid modern suggestions. May not be as expensive as you think. All right, the first one's uh, Osprey. Osprey makes the best wargaming books out there. They just Google Osprey. They, they also make wargaming history books, not just gaming books. Their military World War series is called Bolt Action. This, there's a supplement for it called Tank War, so if we want to throw the heavy metal in there. This one blew up in 2013 and won multiple Origins Awards. This was considered the best modern war game to have come out in years in 2013. So that one looks fantastic if you want like the best of the best of what's out there right now. I don't know how approachable it is, though, because from what I understand from most Osprey games is you're not going to find bolt action miniatures. It's going to be up to you to go provide the minis. And that's how they do it. Their Frostgrave fantasy game is the same thing. You just use any fantasy miniatures you have, and then you can play Frostgrave. Now, what looks cooler to me, bolt action looks neat, but it looks a little too heavy, is a series of games called Flames of War. This is also fairly modern. I didn't look up which bullet came out. But what I like about this one is the scale. They scaled everything down. Now, it's not micro armor. I don't know if people are old enough to remember micro armor where your tanks fit on a dime. This isn't that small, but it's, I don't know, it's 15 millimeter, I think, or 20 millimeter scale versus your big 28, 32 millimeter fantasy ones. I would call this epic scale because that's what it reminds me of. What this means is you can field a bigger army for much less money. You don't need, well, you need as many miniatures, but they're smaller and cheaper. And the other thing I like is they are really good at putting out box sets, starter sets. Like, you can just buy a full army. Uh, and in this case, I suggest that Boudet's co-worker check out Flames of War Stalingrad. That is a tank-based starter that comes with, I think it's five tanks. All right. Well, I found something myself today that's made to be both inexpensive and easy for a war game. Additionally, while it's for miniatures, there's no reason you couldn't work with chits or cards or whatever you have as long as you stick, pick a scale and stick to it. Uh, it doesn't come with miniatures. This is a, you know, BYO. But this is the Fubar system from fubarwargames.wordpress.com. Now, this site is a little bit out of date, uh, and I saw some indication that they've moved on to Facebook or the like, but I was having a little trouble tracking them down. But the rules are all still there to download. The great part about this system is that it's one page. The entire design spec was a small unit, uh, a sm small unit action war game that fit on a single page of A4 paper, nice. and that's what they did. So twelve years ago, they built this war game system, and they've been revising, tweaking, and theming it ever since. If you want fantasy, World War II, modern, Warhammer 40k, aliens, they have it all, and all the rules fit on one page 
and then they've got some other downloads for uh you know vehicles and and uh sheets you can work out your uh your army components on and take advantage units on but uh it's a fantastic little system and you can use it with whatever you've got sounds cool that's time to break up the plastic army man that's what that makes me think right then i'm sure you could uh, you know yeah. it really does seem like it that's cheap minis all right, one last historical war game recommendation for me. Now, this is if you can find it. Sean pulled off the game he couldn't find. Maybe I should have. Back in 2005, Avalon Hill and Wizards of the Coast got together and put out an Axis and Allies miniature game. This is back when Wizards of the Coast put all the D&D pre-painted minis and the Star Wars minis. Well, they did Axis and Allies ones, too. The key here is that all the miniatures are pre-painted and pre-assembled and come with the rules for that unit in the box with that unit. So you buy a pack of tanks, you get all the rules for that tank. Now, you do need the base rules. You're still buying an army. You still have to do that, but you don't have to worry about any of the hobby stuff. You're not assembling, you're not painting, you're not doing any of that part. Now, we've covered a bunch of historical war games and games featuring tanks and military stuff. I want to talk about some other miniature game alternatives. Now, I mainly want to do this because there's some really cool alternatives out there that I want to highlight because they're very unique, and I don't know if people are aware of these, well, did exist at least. <laughs> There's a lot of wars, both real and imaginary, that have been or can be simulated. Why stop at just one of them? All right. So first up, I mentioned Commanding Colors. I basically already covered this, but there are a lot more games than Memoir 44. There's Battle Lore, which is fantasy armies battling each other. Get the second edition, skip the first. Second's way better. There's a Commanding Color Napoleonics and which is considered the, one of the best of the series, which I actually own downstairs. And Commanding Color Ancients, those use wooden blocks with stickers on them to represent units. All the units you need come in the game, and, and there are a lot. There's uh, 280 stickers in the base box. That, that I didn't have Netflix when I got that game. That kind of sucked. Uh, there's even a Game of Thrones version called Battle of Westeros. There are a ton of Commanding Color games, and I actually have not played a bad one except for a modern one that was put out by Richard Board called Abaddon. I would stay away from that one, despite it being less than 15 bucks on Amazon. All right, well, I'm going to start way off of our original theme with the number two war game on Board Game Geek right now, War of the Rings 2nd Edition. Mm -hmm. To say this game gets a lot of love is a true understatement. This is the Lord of the Rings in a box, and if you happen to get bored of this multi-hour 4.08 weight masterpiece, mm -hmm. there are half a dozen expansions which can add even more depth and unit types to the game. But what shocked me was, as well as all this, yep. and I mean, this game has 3.4 thousand 10 ratings on BGG. Wow, uh, that's a lot. If you, um, from the, the total of ratings below 5, or 5 and below, is less than the number of 6 ratings. Like, it's, it's just, like, Jeez. the ratings are, are, no, are it's... hugely skewed to the positive here. And at Amazon.com, it's like 65 bucks right now for 200-plus oh. minis. But so, it is a fantasy war game. <laughs> I do own this one. It's in the pile of shame. I don't play two-player games, especially four-hour two-player games. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. This is one maybe we should plan so sometime when you're down. Yeah, I yeah. Break when there are the no rings. events at CG. Yeah, like when there's no <laughs> events. Like this will be our Sean and I play Lord of the Rings for the first time. War of the Rings, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah I own this. It's it's in, actually at the bottom of one of the piles of shame. What's really impressive, they put out a deluxe edition with all painted minis. Oh, oh. wow. <laughs> it, it, it was like $1,000, which actually makes me worry that some of those ratings are people's um confirmation bias for spending that much. <laughs> But still, with those that many, even yeah, if no, that's it's, it's, 500 of them, it's still... Yeah, yeah I've heard really good are. things about that game. Um, I, That was one I managed to pick up when Geekropolis closed that I, I didn't want to take, and Big J was like, no, no, it's supposed to be the best game ever. And I'm like, ah, just haven't gotten around to it, like many other games. I said two up two players, four hours, or, or possibly longer. I know it's a big game. Yep. It just doesn't happen here. We don't... The D and I don't have... If we have four <laughs> hours, there's other things we're doing. Yep, no, and I don't mean that in a... <laughs> Yeah. Way. All right. Back on track, sort of. Uh, this is one I found fascinating. I This game blew my mind because at the time I was still spending hundreds of dollars on Warhammer miniatures, and this alternative seemed really cool. It's a miniature war game alternative that came back in 2005, and it's called Battlegrounds. Now, this is a rank-and-file miniature game, like ranks of units, wheeling, using musicians, doing all the, the Warhammer fantasy battle stuff is the way I think of it, because that was, that was my first game. You got 
all that changing ranks and formations, right? But no minis, absolutely none. What you have are cards, and the cards show the units from top down. And you literally wheel the units as if like the base of the miniatures. It'd be like playing miniatures with just a bunch of bases out. And then the other neat thing is they were laminated, and you could use dry erase. Well, actually, I think back then it was actually wet erase you had to use because dry erase wasn't that popular. And you could you just cross off units as they died. I gotta say, like this, this I thought was really cool. Though I would have this on the main list for for Rob's coworker, but I think they only ever did fantasy. So I didn't see a historical version, which I'm kind of surprised. Like the concept was so cool. All right. Well, for my final recommendation, I'm gonna hope that Rob and his friend have kids. Because if you have kids, you probably have Lego or some form of Lego compatible building brick. And if you have Lego, then you can have Brick Wars, the building brick combat system from Brick Wars at B-R-I-K Wars.com. Mm -hmm. And as a side note, I did notice that the FUBAR system I mentioned earlier can be used with Playmobil. So if you huh. aren't a Lego person but are a Playmobil person, you might want to check out using FUBAR for those reasons. For those toys as a combat system. So Deanna will know what I'm talking about now. We might have to download Fubar because my kids did some Playmobil Army thing. I live tweeted it when it happened. <laughs> so a bunch of people saw it where I was just quoting the stuff and it was all about the reserves and these people to get to move up and the torturers <laughs> do this. And that was all with Playmobil. So that yeah. might be perfect. Fubar is only one page. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> I might have to give my cop a copy of that. Um, you mentioned Brick Wars. That reminded me of something else. Well, not. It's military, but not um, historical. Is uh, Mobile Frame Zero. This is a mech battle using Lego. Or, sorry, constructible brick, whatever. It's not necessarily Lego. I actually own a copy of this where you build your mech and you get dice based on what bits you have on it. And when you get blown up, you actually take off parts. And the ne neatest rule in that was the scenery was destructive because it was Lego. Right. So if you shot a wall, you actually removed bricks, bricks from it and it gave less cover. So that's another one that might be worth checking out. All right, last one is the strangest game on my list. Um, I've talked many times about how I like unique mechanics, and that's definitely what this has. This was a game called Disc Wars. It was originally released by some like collectible card game company, and you would buy booster packs of these things, and it was generic fantasy. Thankfully, Fantasy Flight got the rights to that and just released a Warhammer Fantasy Battle version. In this game, your miniatures are replaced by different sized discs. So these aren't maneuvering like the other ones. The neat bit here is you literally flip the disc to move across the battlefield, which you can flip them any way so that you can do some really neat stuff with maneuvering around things and turning. Plus the size of the disc actually affected either how quick the unit was or how maneuverable it was. So like your giant dragon might only get to flip once, but it was a huge disc, so it covered a huge part of the battlefield. Whereas your little skaven were little tiny discs, but they could flip multiple times so they could get around all the corners. When combat happens is if they overlapped, and of course there were rules for ranged combat and ranged rulers because it was a Warhammer game, and it used dice-based combat, but I just thought it was such a neat concept. And to me, it like, yeah, it was a simplified version of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, but I didn't have to take out my miniatures, I didn't have to get out all my range rulers, I didn't have to get build my army ahead of time, I just sat down, I picked up some of these discs, we sat down, put out a 3v3 board and played. Uh, I really liked it. Like to me, it it scratched that same itch. It let me get my orc on and play my orc army without having to get my orc army out. And I didn't have to buy more units. Like you just got the units that came. There were expansions for other armies, but like there weren't more orcs. You just you bought the orc box, you bought the elf box, you bought the orc box, the other box. The problem is, it didn't do so good, and it's dead. I think if I remember correctly, it was dead before Fantasy Flight lost the Warhammer role license. So that was just that game didn't do well. I still have a copy. It's neat. It's a very cool game. It's definitely something different. But again, you're stuck to fantasy. Like, you're, you know, no tanks here. Well, except you count the Dwarven Steam Tank. But that's something else. Yeah, so they came out with Disc uh, uh It was Amigo that came out with the original Disc Wars. The original, yeah. Uh, and then they did Legend of the Five Rings, Warhammer, uh, and they did three or two expansions or two versions of the, the Warhammer They're one, expansions. I guess. Yeah, there's the Dwarf Hold and the something. I can't remember what the other one is. Yeah, it's uh, Disc Wars Hammer and Hold and Disc Wars Legion of Darkling. Yeah, Undead. That's what it was. The Dwarves and the Undead. But uh, last last printing was 2014. Yeah, that's six years now. Yeah, and the orig but the original one was from 1999. Oh. Yeah, I say it was the collectible card game. Yeah. It, was, it was Magic the Gathering. I did Magic the Gathering. And you would buy boosters, and you would get random discs in it, right? And you'd be like, oh, I got a whatever. And I got to admit, I thought it was stupid then. <laughs> Once they put the Warhammer name on it, I gave it a shot. Actually, I got to thank uh, local gamer Matt Casagrande. 
who uh, that pulled that one out. He he brought that game out, and I tried it, and I'm like, ooh, this is actually really good. And another, here's here's just for a total offshoot. You want to talk about miniature games? Let's talk about Blood Bowl. Buying a team, paying a team, that's paying the ass. Blood Bowl Team Manager, in my opinion, is a better game, and it's a card drafting game. It's way off track, but it is a miniature game that you can replace the miniature with and actually play, in my opinion, a better game. We should play Blood Bowl Team Manager sometime. Because we should. I, love I don't Blood think Bowls. you've tried it. And I've never tried the, the Team Manager. Yeah. I love Blood it Bowl. It is really good. Really good. It manages to catch that feel. You just play out highlights of each match and see who wins the tournaments. Right. and. You get the money and you buy your star players. Like it just it, it gets that whole league feel yeah, yeah. without the three hour game of moving your miniatures and watch your guys fall over and the ball just not go anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Um all right. All right. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, let's head over to the lobby and see what they think. All right, I saw some stuff going on there. I don't think we have any real Wargamers in the chat, but I do see some miniature Wargamer alternatives mentioned. So uh, Ryan just mentioned uh, Battle Lore, uh, which does seem to be a... No, that's a Command and Colors. I mentioned that one. That's a Command and Colors. There were two of them. There's You want to get second edition. I think Jeff joined in a little later. We'd already covered that one. That was actually my, my first recommendation for a replacement of an army-building war game was to pick up battle lore or sorry, pick up a command and colors game. And my recommendation was for, um, memoir 44. Cause the, the person, the question was about war games specifically featuring tanks and memoir has tanks. But if you want others battle lore, the second edition is fantastic. They did this really neat thing. It's weird. Okay. Battle lore. This is almost a uh, bonus content in a way. The original battle war decided it wanted to be a historic war game, but threw in fantasy elements and you play through the war of the roses. They don't tell you that, but that's what you're doing. And there's a bunch of set scenarios where you play through it, starting with the Battle of Agincourt. Wait, they didn't call it War of the Roses, but they didn't change the names of the battles. <laughs> Odd. And yes, I actually know a couple historic battles. Told you, I play some of these. Not a lot. I don't do the Hex Encounter thing. I do the other ones. Um, and the game was really good. Like, it was a really solid, semi-historic, you know, like it, the Agincourt was a bunch of air archers versus a bunch of uh, uh, cavalry. So it was an interesting fight, right? And it was really cool. And then you get to the next scenario and adds new stuff. And then it throws in some scenery and stuff. But then you get to the rules for heroes. So all of a sudden you have these hero characters. And when you roll these certain numbers on the dice, you get spells. And then you have these historic battles with these heroes that are coming in, just basically messing with it. And it just didn't mesh well. So then what came out was Battle Lore Second Edition, where they went, know what people liked was the heroes and the spells. So let's throw out all the historic thing. And what they literally do now is it's neat because there's a deck of battlefields and you shuffle it and the one side draws one from their deck and the opponent draws one from their deck. Actually, I think you draft. You get two or three and you pick them. And when you put those two cards together, that gives you the map for the battlefield. And there's like something like 3,000 possible combinations with the cards in the original game. So there's no historical accuracy here. And then those cards determine where your units go and everything else. And then there's army building rules. And Battle Lore is fantastic. It's, it is a really good commanding colors game. And then if you want the historic thing, that's when you get into, like I said, there's Napoleonics, there's Command and Color Ancients, and Memoir is the uh, the modern war version. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a huge pool to dive into. Like when I started researching this today, uh, it was like, wow, I mean, there are I mean, there's so many war gamers out oh, yeah. there and the historical re recreationist versus the fun war gamers and yeah, simulationist versus gamers. Yeah, there's all these different uh, cliques within the war gaming community. And they really do ha still have some of these, you know, forums deep in the depths of the, where they've been forever. Uh, you know, if uh, or if you can yeah. find them and if you know where to where to look, uh, there's a ton of stuff out there, and and it's incredible. They'll they they do a lot of you know house ruling things, and it's like, well, this tank this tank doesn't actually fire that way, so we're gonna do this, that, and the other thing, and. Uh, there is there, the term grognar comes from war gamer so yeah, yeah. napoleonic <laughs> war gamer specifically uh no the thing i stayed away from most of those just because hex encounter to me is something totally different versus miniature war gaming but if you're looking to replace miniature war gaming i think it's an option whereas the board games the euro games the battle lords to me are a little more thematic a little more in between um what i what's odd is there's no like x-wing equivalent like like quick i guess that was the access and Allies miniature game that didn't last 
Right. But I couldn't find anything like there's like if you're into planes, there's um, Wings of Glory and Ace of A Ace of Aces. So there are some plain ones, but I didn't see them. And, Nav and Naval is another totally different. Yep. Naval battle is another thing. It's almost like train games. Yep. I yeah, know it's it's a very war war games in general are very niche yeah. and then because I mean the number one war game I wasn't even gonna re re recommend because it's actually a very heavy card based. Cold War simulation that doesn't Twilight really Struggle. get into the um uh, that really doesn't get into the whole sort of simulation that it sounded like Rob and his friend were into. Yeah, if Twilight Struggle still this is the number one war game that runs. Yeah. It's an area control Euro game. It's not even a war game. Yeah. There's no units. You don't move units. You yeah, don't exactly. it's it's, <laughs> it's, a... it's card play and it's area control. It's yeah. not a war game. There, there's a big debate about whether it's a war game. I'm on the it's not a war game side. It's a game about war that does not make it a war game. Yeah. And no, I don't think it's a good recommendation at all. If you were into like painting miniatures and building armies, no. Twilight yeah, exactly. Struggle, that's why. That's why I skipped down to absolutely the War of the to War of the Rings instead because I'm like, you know, I I can't. It's it actually sounds like it's probably a really great game. Yeah, it's it was it's the number one game on Board Game Geek for ten years. Yeah. It it was beat out by Pandemic Legacy, then beat out by Gloomhaven, and now slowly dropping because it's. They haven't updated it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any comments on the uh, the Christmas uh, Car Wars that came out? I they put out this car game from Steve Jackson Games. I don't know. They put this name of this good game on it and released <laughs> something new. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, you, they're selling. On, they're thoughts. cashing in on their own name, which I fully expect them to do. But I expected the game they produced to have something in common with the original, other than cars with guns. It it is not. There, there's nothing similar. This this is. A more complicated Wings of War X-Wing. Um, you have the same template for every car, so it's not even X-Wing. It's simpler than that. Um, I was willing to watch through a full actual play until they got to the point where they kept talking about how... I forget the term they used. It's it's not simulation. It's Funimation or something. And they got to the point where if your cars crash, and when your cars crash, you do this stuff to figure out damage, and then the rule is, and this is a game that's going to have tournaments, you just push your car the rest of the distance and wherever the two cars end up is where they end up. And I'm like, no, not in Car Wars. Like, like this is meant to, more simulation than that. Yeah. If I'm going to be playing in a tournament where there's prizes, I don't want someone nudging my car. Like, just pushing it until they end up where they end up. That was the worst rule I've ever heard in a miniature game. Yeah, especially for something tournament related. You don't want right, exactly. to you don't want to fudge you don't want to fudge around with like oh, the guy you pushes pushed it wrong. you pushed a bit to the left instead of straight yeah. like oh. I, I would not I mean, imagine being a referee for that kind of tournament. I, exactly. You tear your hair out. Oh man, no. I it except for that, it looked like it's interesting overly Steve Jackson just likes complicated games, right? That's the kind of games they make. They're fiddly. And it still had a lot of that. Like it, despite the fact it was not Car Wars, because Car Wars, oh my God, you like you needed a, you need craft paper to figure out how to turn and turn yeah, yeah. templates, and points and skid tracks and and tracking each individual tire and they abstracted a lot of that, but you still had a bunch of this stuff. And I gotta say, I played Gaslands. Gaslands is fantastic. Gaslands is Car Wars. If you want to play Car Wars in 2020, pick up Gaslands. You're gonna have more fun. You get to make the miniatures yourself. You know to matchbox the cars. That was the other thing. Car Wars. Okay, you have Car Wars? None of the miniatures matter. You pick one and put it on a base. Yeah. It literally meant nothing. There are no stats for the different vehicles in Car Wars. Oh, I just... I was I was very disappointed. Uh, I backed Ogre partly so that they would put out Car Wars, because I do like the original. I only, I only ever played it digitally, but I actually owned the Deluxe Edition and tried to read through it. I could read through it. I could play it. I just don't know if it sounds like that much fun. It would be fun with the right people, I think. Like, Sean and I would probably have fun playing Car Wars because we get into that minutia and figuring out the inches. And But most of the people I'd game with normally probably would not have fun with Car Wars. They might with the new edition. So I'm all for it. If people want to get the new edition of Car Wars, feel free. Enjoy. Just don't expect that old, crunchy simulation game. So the guys are talking about demolition uh, derby games and the thing. Uh, there is actually something reasonably recent called diesel demolition derby that came out in uh 2017 um it's a, it's a card based uh it's a it's a card game basically but um there's a of... fantasy flight silver line game might be called carmageddon damn 
Hey, it's not an AMA. I'm going to Google. Terrible. I'd be surprised if they have a Carmageddon. Uh... That's the video game, right? Silverline Games. Here's the list of them. Yeah, there's no Carmageddon. It is a Demolition Derby game, and it's actually solid. In 1999, something came out called Authentic Demolition Derby. <laughs> I'm on. There's a lot of these games. Wow. But it only has 12 ratings. So I... Oh, you know what? They're, some of the modern games are considered Silver Line games, which they shouldn't be, in my opinion. I'm still missing it. Minotaur Lords, Quick Samurai. Yeah, yeah, this, looks, this looks a lot like a game that you know, Mo and I would have written in university. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> but this uh, authentic demolition derby that came out in 1999. It's, you know, a simulation of a real demolition derby as it is done at your local fairgrounds. Um, but again, 12 people have played it. What the hell? I can picture it. Published you had a dash game for... works. The only you thing dash... they've ever published. <sighs> I hate when I can't remember. Well, maybe we can dig that up at the uh, the end of the show or during the coffee. Yeah, uh... picture. I didn't own it myself. That was part of the problem. That was part of the problem. Wasteland Express. No. Why do people <laughs> always recommend that as a Car Wars game? There is nothing. It's it's post apocalyptic. That's it. Please, people, stop recommending that as a race game, a car wreck game. Russian Crush. I have that one. It wasn't very good. Thunder Road. That's not. Wreckage. Wreckage. That is the name of the game. Wreckage from Fantasy Flight Game. Which, good luck trying to find it. Yeah, 2003 release. All right. I wouldn't have got that. Like, I wasn't even <laughs> close. Like, what was running through my head? Nowhere near Wreckage. Yeah, 2003 Fantasy Flight Games. It does look interesting, though. It was good. It, it was it was surprisingly well done. Like all the all the Silverline games are cheaper, lighter games that are quick to set up. And that they kind of remind me of the the eight bit box. There's something we have to review. It I got to get not, that. Back. It does not rate well. Oh, I remember having fun <laughs> with it, but this was yeah. years ago too. That, that is not a modern game. All right. All right. Be sure to stick around after we're done the recording. We got a preview of our next giveaway coming up in the after show. Package showed up yesterday. I am going to be opening it. I've now teased it twice. Have you figured out what it is yet? We'll be checking in the lobby again uh, later throughout the show, or later during the show. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, or share with your friends. We're going to look to grow the brand even more. We've had a few things already happen this year. You can get in on the ground floor. I don't know. We have that much more still coming? We probably do. There'll be something. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released in the previous week. Uh, blog posts, unboxings, actual plays, reviews, I don't know, whatever else we put out. I'm going to let you know. You can YouTube, sign up. on the blog, all those places. You can sign I'm up at newsletter.tabletop.bellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, one of those new things Sean mentioned is last week we announced a huge overhaul of our Tabletop Bellhop patron, Patreon. We wiped it clear. Well, as best we could because we let people keep their chairs if they had spots already. But we wiped the table clear. We set up a new board, and we've got some new stuff out there, and I am really happy with uh, the feedback we've gotten so far. People do seem to dig it. We had a significant increase in backers and people opting to increase their support levels to the new reward levels, which is fantastic. So thanks to all of you who have chosen to support the show, no matter what level you've chosen to back us at. Now, for the next few weeks, we're going to be a little self-serving here. We're going to take a moment to talk about one of our backer levels each week until we get through all of them, just to highlight what you may be missing out on and make the people we're already getting it bask in the glory of having that thing already. This week, we're looking at the tip the bellhop level. All right, this is our most basic tier. This is the, the starter level. Um, we had originally started at a buck, but you know what? Everyone on Patreon says start at two. Patreon emails me like once a month saying you should have a $2 starter level. So we're like, fine, we'll up to $2. This is our general thank you level. 
Now, besides our thanks, we do give you something at this level. Many patrons don't, or patrons, patreons, patrons, I don't know, whatever the terminology is. Many projects don't. At this level, you do get access to patron-only posts on Patreon. That's pretty basic. I write one of these once a week and tend to write behind-the-scenes stuff, usually about whatever talk topic we talked about the week previous. So this is almost like two, like for the people here on Wednesday, I'm actually talking about the stuff from our Word episode two weeks ago. So it takes a bit for me to catch up, but it just gives you some insider info, why I wrote about this thing, why if I had difficulty writing about it, or random thoughts that came out, why we picked the question, etc. Next, you get access to our pre-production show notes. What Mo and I are using right now while recording the show, you get to learn all the dirty secrets about our spelling and grammar. Which is pretty horrible. I'm pretty sure reading my spelling requires a sand check every time you get through. Anything I write is actually a mythos tome. Finally, you get access to our private Discord channel. This is the one I'm actually most excited about at this level. Uh, this is where you can interact with us, with me, Sean, Deanna, Tori, Kat, and other fans of the show. Uh, we're all in there now. We got some more people. I'm seeing a lot more interaction. I'm really happy with the way that's going. Uh, that was Deanna's suggestion. We actually like half the cost of this, just to try to build the community a bit more. And I don't plan on putting it back up. Yeah, so to support the show, just head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. And if you look at the show notes, you'll see that Mo is tangent guy tonight. I don't know. I can't stay on track tonight for any I had too much coffee. It's my only coffee of the day. We need the coffee break. All right. This is it. Here's the answer. I got a package yesterday. Inside are some copies of the hot new party game Medium from Greater Than Games. Uh, this game was the talk of Gen Con. Every single, I swear, everyone, Every podcast I listen to, every blog I read, people were talking about this game. It was like not like it was it was the mind at Origins last year. Like it was just nuts. Everyone is talking about this. So that means we're pretty much ready for our medium giveaway. Yeah, the only thing I do is I got to play it. I, I need to do the review, right? So here's the plan: over the next two weeks, I'm going to crack a copy of the game open and play it a bunch. I'll do an unboxing. That's why I'm going to try to get that done by the end of the week. I'll be playing it with my regular group, hopefully, Monday night. It's been three weeks in a row. And I'm going to bring it out to public play events, including, uh, I'm probably not going to hit CG Realm this weekend. We'll see. But easy mode for sure. And then, importantly, um, we are going to bring it out to CG Realm for a special game night. But on the 19th of February, that's two weeks from today, that's a Wednesday, right here, live on Twitch, on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast Live, I'll give the official review. Well, just like we're about to review in a game in a few minutes. We'll also release that on the blog, and that is when we'll launch the contest to go live at the same time as the review. The contest will run for three weeks, and we'll be announcing a winner on our live show March 11th. This contest will be open to anyone in North America, and we have two copies to give away. I do apologize, those of you not in North America. I did try to work something out. It didn't happen, and unfortunately, uh, it, actually, if you're not in North America and you're willing to cover the shipping costs, feel free to enter now, in addition, I do have a reward for the locals. I know there's some of you in the chat room tonight. We do have a growing number of Windsor people who want to listen to me. I would have figured they see enough of me around here, but I think it's kind of cool. I am going to do a demo night, specifically at CG Realm. I'm taking over their game night on January 22nd. I've got another copy of the game to give away at that event. The only thing you got to do to enter to win is show up and actually try the game. All right, well, that's right. We're giving away three copies of Medium. Thank you, Greater Than Games, for the opportunity to do this for our fans. Yeah, big thanks, Greater Than Games. All right, one finalist bit of Save Myself promotion, because that's what our announcement section is. A quick reminder that Patreon backers at the hotel guest level or higher will get five bonus entries into this contest. Up next, a preview of Gorinto from Grand Gamers Guild. Gorinto was designed by Richard Yanner and features art from Josh Capel. It's going to launch on Kickstarter by Grand Gamers Guild on February 12th. That is one week from today for those of you here live. Tomorrow, for those of you catching us on the podcast, and I don't know, Wednesday, for those of you who catch us when we go out on YouTube on uh, this segment, it'll be on Friday. So Saturday, Sunday, what is that, four days from now for them? Something like that. Anyway. Um, from what I know, the plan is to have it in people's hands this year, assuming it funds, but don't quote me on that. Uh, besides the fact that may not be the actual date they're aiming for, you know, the Kickstarters get delayed. 
So we've played a prototype version so far, which means we've got the rules near or at their final form, but we didn't play with pieces that will be coming out with the Kickstarter. And that's an important fact, is some of the biggest problems I would have had with the game were physical and therefore won't actually impact the game. Yeah, very true. So Mark Spector from Game Gamers Guild did assure me the rules are pretty much finalized. Now, there are some feedback we provided that you may throw in, but like the basic mechanics are not going to change in this game. The basic rules, how the game is played, he may toss in some variants. Now, he did want to stress that the game will be significantly physically better than the copy I played. Now, that's not going to matter for most of you watching on the podcast or even in the video because I don't have the copy of the game here. But if anyone checks out my blog post, you'll see pictures of the components. Those are not the final components. Uh, the mountain, which we'll explain what that is later, is going to be spread out so you can actually reach the tiles. It's about, uh, what do you say, a third smaller than it should have been. The tiles themselves are going to stack. Uh, based on the prototype pictures he sent me, it looks like upwards, if anyone's played that. Uh, and there will be other improvements. The thing to note is that all the pictures on the blog, any pictures I share on social media, uh, Sean may put up a picture up between our faces for the cover of the box. All of that may change by the time the game actually comes out. What we're talking about is a prototype. Also, due to the fact there's a prototype, I like to start off every one of these reviews telling you to go watch my unboxing video. Well, I don't have one of those. And I'm not even going to talk about the components because they're going to be different when the actual game comes out. I will say this was very playable, though. Like, I've gotten some prototypes from companies before that look like prototypes. This, I, I bought completed, finished games that had less polish than this prototype. Yeah, absolutely. I, while I would have had comments and complaints based on the existing components if you had told me it was the final game i wouldn't have doubted you yeah no <laughs> it, it was close enough you'd be like what are these extra bits for that's about it but they, they were definitely serviceable now for those of you who don't know what a garinto is a garinto is a style of japanese pagoda made up of a stack of five different stone shapes these shapes represent the five elements of earth air fire water and void now i didn't know this myself i had to google it so don't feel bad if you're in the same boat um, this is also what's on the cover of the box. So if anyone's seen the cover of the box, like, what, what's this abstract thing? That's a Gorinto. Um, that's a, and the playing piece that marks the seasons is also a Gorinto. So the name's in there. Doesn't really matter that much for what you're doing in the game, but there is some tie-ins, actually. Surprisingly high number of tie-ins, actually, from what I consider an abstract game. In Gorinto, players increase their understanding of the elements by collecting tiles representing each of those five elements. Tiles are collected by moving a tile from the path, which is the edge of the board, onto the mountain, the main board, which is a five by five grid of tiles. What the tile, tile, which tile you put on the mountain determines which tiles you can then collect. Collected tiles go into stacks by element on your own personal player your board. So you're, you're tableau building in a way. Now the game's played over four seasons. At the end of each season, players score points based on randomly determined goals set at the beginning of the game. The scoring is based on the player's knowledge of the elements, which is what that personal player board represents. You're having four uh, fire tiles means you have four knowledge in fire. And that's what ties into the scoring cards. Now, at the end of the game, there's also two bonus scoring cards that score, and those are based on two of the five elements. So every game, two elements are worth a bit more. So the rules are incredibly simple. And teaching is made easy by the fact that you just have to describe how you take a piece and when. And then mm -hmm. scoring, because it's always random, becomes part of the game, not part of the teach. Yeah, it's true. You don't have to preload the how scoring is going to work. That's a good point. So the way you actually play is on a player's turn, you take one of the tiles from the path, which is adjacent to what they call the mountain, the big grid of tiles in the middle, and you put it in the same row or column you took it from. So you, you have to follow the grid. Now, the element of the tile that's placed determines which tiles you are eligible to remove, and each of the elements different. And they're short enough, I'm going to go through all of them. Fire is really simple. You can take tiles from the same column in the mountain. Water is the opposite, where you can take tiles from the same row. Wind lets you take from orthogonally adjacent, whereas void is the opposite, letting you take diagonally adjacent. The weirdest one, though, is earth. That actually lets you take tiles from the stack you just put the earth tile on. And explain, it's explained right there on the board. You don't actually have to remember anything. It's all right there. You can just stare at the board and all the information you need for your turn is there, but other than what you might want to actually want to choose is right yes. there in front of you. Yeah. No, it's no strategy tips on the board, but it, it clearly shows what each tile type does. Um, important to note for people like red meeple Ryan in our chat room, the tiles are both color coded and have symbols on them. 
So there is a way to tell them apart. What I don't think is going to happen is I don't think they'll be tactically different because you have to pull them from a bag. Then that's a compromise you're kind of stuck with. So you will be able to tell the tiles apart either by reading the symbol or by the colors. Now, this is kind of neat, too. So once you put your tile out, the number of tiles you get is based on your knowledge of that element thematically. And what that's represented by is how many of that tile type you already own plus one. If tiles can be taken, they must be taken, which gets really important by the end game. So on your first turn, you're going to play one tile. You don't have any tiles you own, so you're only going to get to draw one tile, right? Makes sense. But in later turns, you're going to take more tiles because your personal style supply of tiles representing your knowledge is going to grow. So for example, say you have three fire tiles on your player board. When you play a fire tile from the path onto the mountain, you're going to get to take four tiles from that column. So this is actually a wonderful and frustrating <laughs> aspect of the game. You can easily end up taking more than you want. I didn't see a game or wasn't involved in a game where there wasn't someone who, at some point during the game, wished they could take less tile than they had to at that point. Yeah, just and the, the reason for that is the scoring tiles, because you just keep conti continue drafting tiles around the board until the end of the season, which happens once there's not enough tiles on the path for someone to go. Then everyone scores both goal, goal cards that are in play. Now, the first player then passes the player in last place, and you move to the next season. That's a neat catch-up mechanic. Uh, a little bit more about that later, though. At the end of the game, you're also going to score those two bonus cards, which are going to give you points for collecting two of the five elements. Now, in addition to the base game, the prototype copy I was sent also had five dragon tiles. As far as I know, these are in the Kickstarter. They may be a stretch goal. Again, Kickstarter's not live yet. I couldn't tell you. What these are for is you can mix them in with the rest of the tiles, and they work as a wild card. When you put a dragon from the path, you choose what element it acts as, so determining what you're going to draft. But when drafting it from the mountain, it's different. It's still a wild card, but you get to decide where in your personal supply it goes. Uh, there's also a bunch of different ways to set up the mountain, which I actually thought was really neat. Actually, a lot of fun and surprisingly changes the way the game plays, where the, the, the heights of the different stacks actually did change it. Finally, now this was not included in my copy of the game, but Mark sent me the rules for a team-based mode, which will be an official variant for four players. And this is really neat. In this mode, your scoring cards are placed between each pair of players. And you only score the ones on your left and right, so think between two cities. Players are partnered with the person sitting opposite, who has no access to those scoring cards and has their own. After you take tiles, you must give one tile to your partner each turn. That is a fascinating way to play. Absolutely. So, overall, while you're not getting a huge volume of components in this game, I mean, this is not a Cthulhu Death May Die or, you no. know, some Simon game. This is a tiny little, you know, fun game. The replayability is massive due to the wide variations in starting forms and scoring. And I should have counted them. There were a number of those scoring cards. I couldn't tell you exactly how many. It was a stack. It yeah. was not a small stack. All right, straight up, I'm going to say it. I love what I've seen in Gorinto so far. This is an excellent and fascinating abstract game. Yeah, and I can only second that. It's one of those games we've talked about where something very simple ends up generating powerful and complex outcomes due to the very simplicity, its very simplicity, simplistic nature. Yeah, the, the, the easy to learn, difficult to master. We've said 100 turns about 100 different games. Now, I will say, of all the times I've played the game and have facilitated being played by others, because I've done that, I've just taught it and let others play, I have heard a couple minor complaints, and I think it's worth bringing them up. These all resolve around four-player plays. I've never heard a complaint at any other player count. The first was that the player in last place can be limited in their options, and it's slightly frustrating, but if the same person goes twice in a row in first, putting that same person in last twice, it can be particularly punishing. The other issue that was brought up is that with four players, you only get two turns per season, whereas all the other player counts, you get three turns, so it feels a little more limiting. Now, that second complaint, I personally didn't see as a problem because it speeds up the four-player game, so it still keeps it in that short time frame. To me, it's just something you need to realize. I think you only really notice it if you play a three-player game and then a four, you're like, oh, wait, I thought I was going to get to draft more. But I did find overall the game flowed better with two and three players. Just with four, it just took a little long. But now with that four-player team mode, throw that out the window. If you're going to play four players, play with that team mode. I really enjoyed that version of play. Yes, you only get the two drafts, but really you're getting four because your partner's also helping you out. And yeah, gameplay was longer, but the 
I don't even know how to talk about it. The interplay between you, what do you need one of these? Do you want one of those? No, no, don't give me that. Well, I got to give you something. Like that whole thing was fascinating. Now, as for the last player problem, I have not seen that in a game I played. I don't know if it was just a fluke or not, but I did mention it to Mark, uh, who has been awesome about communicating with me during this whole thing. And he suggested if players find this a problem, it's really simple. They almost put this in the base rules to just rotate the start player each turn because people are going to feel that's more fair in a way because that means someone goes first in all the seasons anyway. And it may just be a perception issue, maybe not, but that is a perfectly valid variant that do it either way. Like, do, do the catch-up mechanic where the, the player in last goes first or just rotate it if you feel there is it's too punishing for the player in fourth. Yeah. So I played in three and four-player configurations only. And while I wasn't bothered by the turn count issue yeah. in four-player, I did experience and see another person's experience, uh, actually Sean Hamilton. Not Sean. Yeah. So Sean Hamilton and Sean from Hamilton both experienced this final player problem. Now, I don't think it's something that breaks the game, but it does seem to be something that you need to plan into your strategy uh, you know, more so than in many games. You know, in most games these days, going last really doesn't matter that much. Uh, going oh, first does. usually gives an advantage, whereas in this game, I felt giving going last changes things enough that you need to really think about it and plan for that. Um, so whether that's a feature or a flaw, again, that's... It may, yeah, it may just be something you need to be aware of. Personally, I didn't... What I found is it was frustrating because often what you wanted to do, you couldn't do. Someone will have taken your tile. But I never felt I didn't have an option. So it was there was the frustration level of, oh, I wanted that, and you stole it. And then next turn, you did it again. But I still had options. Like, there were still other tiles. There were still very valid placements. So I didn't find it as bad. But I'm also wondering, maybe this is just a Sean problem. So we'll have to introduce the game to another Sean. Mm -hmm. And if that Sean has it, it just could be a Sean problem. <laughs> I don't think that's actually true. Overall, I had a ton of fun playing around with this prototype of Grinto. Uh, I look forward to the Kickstarter campaign myself. I would like to wish Mark and the Grand Gamer Guild luck, but I really don't think they're going to need it. Uh, they have a very solid game here. I have no doubt this will fund unless there's something completely wacky. Excuse me. Unless there's something completely wacky on their Kickstarter. But this isn't their first rodeo. This company put out Endeavor, Age of Sail, a very successful, already delivered, fantastic Kickstarter. So I don't see a problem with the game. I don't see a problem with the company. I personally know a handful of gamers who have already decided they're backing this game, including our Gloomhaven partners, Tori and Kat, who are like, we're buying this. Like They, they played twice. That's it. It took them two games, one, one four-player game and one four-player team game. Like, no, we need this. Yeah, I'm on the fence as to if I'll back the campaign or not, but not because of the quality of the game. It's just a matter of, is it going to be worth it for the number of times I'm likely to get it on the table yeah. compared to something like the Duke? Uh, yeah, if you were, if you got out some local game game events more often, yeah, I'd absolutely. say pick it up. But for playing with your son, you're probably going to have more fun with the Duke. Yeah, exactly. This the, the little bit more theme there is probably going to tie it in. Yep. All right, well, for a more in-depth look at Garinto, check Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year, what games hit our tables. Every week, I'd like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. All right, we got a, I got more than usual this week, which is awesome. Uh, so Friday was our Gloomhaven stream. You know what? Uh, Friday is usually our Gloomhaven stream, and I don't usually talk about it much here. Uh, based on when I went to Origins last year, we actually got some feedback that people were complaining we talked about Gloomhaven a bit too much on the show. Plus, we were spoiling things, which I, is totally legit. I don't want to spoil anything. But I wanted to mention it this week just because we haven't brought up Gloomhaven. For one, just to remind people, we are still playing. And we do still le live stream those plays when we do play. So those live streams happen Friday night, starting at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Now, the other thing I want to note, too, is for those of you who turned into our early streams, we have done some changes that may interest you in checking them out again. First off, we got a new lighting and camera set up. Now, this isn't amazing. We're, we're looking to get better, but we have improved our lighting and camera setup. Uh, the biggest thing now is we are zooming right in on the action. So you can actually see the characters. You can see what monsters are where. You can see the traps. And for people who watched a long time ago, we've also added the Gloomhaven helper. So you can see what cards are getting drawn by the enemies. The other thing we've done is we are now showing our cards to the camera. So we had feedback that the people who watch our streams mostly are people who have played the scenarios and want to see how we did, or how we did it different, or if we succeeded or they failed, and they want to know what cards we're playing. So we have now adopted 
we're getting better at it. We're not perfect at it yet, but we're at least mentioning the cards we're playing. We're trying to show them on camera so that people can do it. Finally, and this is one that is a bonus to people who join us live. We are now letting our viewers decide our fate. Oh, that's right. If you show up for the start of the live stream, you'll get invited to take part in a poll and decide which scenario the group will play. Now, we've been doing this for a couple weeks, and it's been rather fun. Now, our next session, this is the other reason I want to bring it up. February 14th, the next time we're playing with Gloomhaven, 8.30 p.m. is going to be a big decision in the game. This is one of those branching points in Gloomhaven where it's going to decide the fate of the rest of the campaign, could forever change the face of our map, and you could be there to help decide this fate. So stop by and see, because you don't think we're going to put spoilers in this episode, are do you? Oh, no. Yeah, I, I'm not telling you what that branch is. I'm not even going to mention the, the thing. So yeah, Bloomhaven, we're still doing it. And for those of you who do want a little bit more insider info on what's going on in our games, I am now uh, putting commentary up on the blog. Every time the actual play goes live, I just put a bit of commentary. It's not long, a couple paragraphs about what we did right if I dug the scenario. Like the one of the ones we did recently had one of the coolest maps with some really neat rules for walls. So for those of you who do miss that on here on the podcast, we do I do still cover it on the blog, though just not into the detail we used to. All right, that was Friday. I actually gamed on Sunday, which is kind of unique. Um, we were trying to game Saturday. It didn't work out because of the Super Bowl, which sounds weird, but it's someone had Super Bowl plans on Saturday, but we're free Sunday. Whatever. Um, Tori and Kat were free. So they came over and they played a few games. We started off with Corinto, which I already kind of mentioned. We played that twice. First time just to teach them how to play, and the second to try those team-based rules. We already talked about it quite a bit today, but I will say they are backing it. Like, they're like, I, to be honest, Kat's like, I don't care what it costs. This is good. Like, I don't think I can give a better in, in, in endorsement. endorsement than that. I have to say, I do wish I'd gotten to try it at two-player while I was down, yeah. but that's really the only thing that's been missing from my experience with Corinto. I would say you're coming this weekend, but the sad part is I no longer have the game. I had to ship the prototype off to another Canadian reviewer, and as far as I know, it's on its way to Alberta right now. So I got to say, I'm going to miss it. I, 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 that's why I want to keep that. I want to hear. I want to play it again. So the next game we played Sunday with Kate Tor was Orléans. That's an older one. Uh, this ties to my pile of obligations. So I sat down the other day, I think it was after last week or the week before, broke out a, a spreadsheet, made sure I was on track, wanted to see where I was with everything. And I, we're really close to actually having depleted the pile of obligation from Orle from, from Orléans, from uh, Origins. And I'm really happy with that. Like Origins still, like my goal is obviously have it done before the next Origins, but it seems like we might be a month ahead, which is awesome. What's left, though, are a lot of little things, and one of them is the Trade and Intrigue expansion for Orléans uh, from Tasty Minstrel Games. Now, I would have liked to have just threw that out and played, and possibly we could have. We're all experienced gamers, but Tori, Cat, and even Deanna had never played Orléans before. So I figured at that point, we should probably start with the core game. Plus, I got to admit, it probably been years, at least a year, since I myself have played, so I knew I could use a refresh. Yeah, and the fact that D hadn't played this yet, I think, shocked yeah. a lot of folks on Twitter. Uh, because, well, we don't all exactly play the same games here on the show. Even when you live together, schedules don't always line up. Things happen. Yeah, and there was, there was a period of time where Deanna had medical issues and was laid up for a while. So I, I'm pretty sure that's when Orleans hit. But yeah, it did happen. So Orleans went great. Uh, I love this game. Like, I love this game since the first time I played it. It was one of those games where you play it once, and you're like, ooh, this could be, like, top 50. And then you play it twice, you're like, this could be top 5 or top 10. And the next time you're like, this could be top 5. Like, it is really good. I was very pleased to see everyone else enjoyed it as well. Uh, Deanna, in particular, was quite smitten by it. She had the, can we play again? Yeah, I know it's midnight, but can we play again? Like, I knew it was going to be her kind of game, but, like, she liked it more than I thought she would. And I feel bad that I hadn't showed it to her before. So it sounds like it won't be uh, too hard to get those expansions on the table. No, probably not. It, it's got a bit of a setup time. It's it's not a short game. That's the problem. I, I, I'm i probably not going to be bringing this one out. This is a good Monday night game group. It's it's not the best for, like, a CG Realm. Well, it depends. Like, if I'm at CG Realm, I'm supposed to be teaching Azul, and instead I'm playing Terraforming Mars, that's not great. If instead I'm playing Orleans, that's not great. It's it's a little bit longer. Um, Speaking of Monday nights, actually, my I, we did get together Monday night. Yep. That's now two Mondays in a row. I know Deanna said we jinxed it, so it's not going to happen again. Um, this time it was Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, Tom Barker, myself, and Deanna. Uh, a while back, we reviewed a board game from Daily Magic Games called Horizons. 
No, I didn't pull the episode number out. I apologize. We'll throw it in the show notes if I remember. Um, while doing that show, the designer actually showed up in our chat, in, a, in, a, in the lobby, our chat room, which I thought was really cool. And one of the things I noted in the review, and I, I felt bad because there's a designer, is that it's a good game. It's a solid game. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's just not great. It just didn't hit that wow factor. It didn't have that level. The other thing is it's sold as a 4X game. Everything's like, ah, oh, sci-fi, quick playing, card-based 4X. But it didn't have an X. There was no extermination. There was no way to attack other players or attack anything. Interestingly, Levi, who was in the chat room, pointed out, he's like, well, have you tried the expansion? The expansion called Extermination, which adds the fourth X in. And I'm like, wow, that's actually pretty cool. Um, for one, it's cool that they, that they made an Extermination and obviously realized there was an X missing. Second, it was really awesome that the designer of the dang game was there in our chat room. Even cooler, he's like, I'll send you a copy of Extermination. Let me know what you think. So, my God, thank you, Levi. That's awesome. I do apologize it took so long to get to the table. Pile of obligations again. Took a bit to get to it, but we did finally get to play this game. Uh, it was really a delight to have a designer in the lobby during a video. You get a whole yep. new perspective and the ability to have a real-time dialogue with someone of that, uh, you know, connection to the game is so powerful yeah like he pointed out there's um erratas on my boards right like that was that was an important thing to note as well so look at quickly at horizons we're going to just cover this really quick it adds three new things new stars new allies and new starting aliens new stars add a random element to set up so that's kind of cool so that not every system's the same new allies adds a new layer of asymmetry to the game giving every player a unique starting ability through that ally and then there's the new aliens, and the new aliens are the extermination part. They're all called the Viliox. And what I thought was neat that I didn't realize, I thought they're going to be their own standalone ally pile. So in the base game, every ally alien type gets its own pile, while well, the Viliox are spread among the other decks. So I thought that was really neat. So you end up with these, and every single Viliox features an ability that in some way attacks another player. And we all know the Bellhop loves his asymmetry done right. Yes, I do. So I go... I'll go into more detail about this once I do a full review. I've only played with it once. I don't want to. I don't want to make any sweeping statements here after only one play. But I will say that we played with people who've played Horizons before. Uh, the four of us that all played, we were all shocked by how big an impact this small pack made to the game. Right from the start, the new suns changed the viability of many of the missions in the mission pack. There were a bunch of cards that we were basically like, none of these will ever happen. Now they're possible, and the ability to actually destroy and or replace an opponent's structure really opened up a lot of new possibilities for play because this is an area control game. Being able to swap out that control can, for one, extend the game, but can also, you don't have the runaway leader problem anymore. You can, you can fight back. And now there's also the ability to form alliances and team up. Like, it's just, the, the game blossomed in a way. It expanded quite a way. Yeah, no, I'm hoping we can maybe get this on the table this weekend because I have yet to even try the base game somehow. True. So uh, it sounds like it's not one you actually have to step up through like Orleans. You can just throw yeah, you could probably X's just throw it. it. The only reason I'd want you to play the original is just to see that step. The difference, yeah, yeah. Just 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 to catch the oh, okay, I see what this did. Yeah, but that's not really that important. So I gotta say I dig it. So far, extermination seems really positive. Uh, I I want to say this completes the game, but I used it once. I, I don't want again. I don't want to make that big a generalization yet. I'm sure you'll hear more about it in the coming weeks. All right. One more. Final game was Orléans, this time using Trade and Ink Street. So this is with Sean Hamilton, Tom, and uh, Deanna. Sean Hamilton and Tom had not played before, but you know what? Having now read the rules for Trade and Ink Street and just played Orléans, uh, the modules that are in there, so this is another one where it's got modules. It's got um, four different modules. They're simple enough and didn't change anything drastically that I thought these players would be able to handle throwing it right in. And we used all of the trade parts of trade in intrigue and skip the intrigue part because the intrigue part's a separate board and you either use a new beneficial deeds board or the intrigue board. Well, we left the intrigue board open. We tried the other three parts of the module. So, so that, what was the one where uh, I think I saw some comments on uh, Twitter saying you sort of skipped the skipped the part you should have skipped? Uh, yeah, I did see that. I can neither deny yeah. nor confirm because I haven't heard it. I've heard intrigue is the weakest part of the expansion. We'll see. So same caveat as Extermination here. I've only played once with the expansion, so I'll save my final thoughts for a full review on a later episode. 
But I will say the Beneficial Deeds board, which replaces a board in the original game, was so much better. I, it was just really well done, really opened up the possibilities. The new buildings, there's three of them, toss them in the game, forget about it, just leave them in. I, if I forgot I even owned the, ex the expansion, that'd be fine. Um, the new pickup and delivery system, eh. The biggest problem with this, though, was whoever made Orleone, this is not an expansion that I think was designed at the same time as the base game and then pulled out to put back in because, by the gods, trying to read those towns' names, all the towns have the exact same icon to show towns, so they don't look different. There's nothing graphically different. Trying to find the town on the order card to compare it to the map was horrible. Now, there is a small map with an X, but, like, if you have a hard time trying to find cities and ticket to ride, don't even pick this up. Like, you couldn't do it if you can't find cities and ticket to ride. And I have a pretty hard time on ticket to ride. That was an issue. And that really tainted that part of the expansion. So, I don't know. I, I think it, it was good enough rules, but it was so frustrating having to stand up and look and have, look, and, oh, it's so, it was bad. It was really bad. So we, we were even doing the thing where the card come out and be like, all right, point to it. What do they want? But then you'd forget. You're like, oh, which town wanted this? Uh, except for that. But yeah, overall, so far, so good. All right. Yeah. Well, I finally uh, got Minecraft Builders and Biomes uh, home to my place to give it a whirl with my kids to see how they liked it. And we got it to the table. Now, this is really a step up for them. Is it really mm. is one of the first hobby games that they've tried. It wasn't a deck builder. Uh, now, they both had a great time playing it. And I have to say, this game is so easy to nice uh but because of that multi-round scoring built into it it doesn't lack depth like it really is a solid hobby game um despite being you know like a quick a pretty quick teach so did they get the um the strategy of it or the rules of it or both they did i said uh, i think my son had a little more trouble with the strategy and, and the planning ahead um now we only got it out once due to you know schedules more than interest both kids enjoyed it and they both pointed it out without any prompting that it was a much better game than the Minecraft card game that we'd played. Uh, uh, yeah. So while I did win, my daughter, who's uh, 12, took an interesting direction that very nearly beat me. Nice. Uh, so she actually, uh, you know, worked very well with the, the, the rounds, planning, uh, probably could have planned ahead a little bit better, but she actually sort of point, point starved a little earlier in the game. But then went for the lowest scoring um, uh, tile in the end round and built up on multipliers. Oh, okay. Uh, so, you know, it was only worth three points per tile she had, whereas what I was going for was, for was worth five. But then she started grabbing creepers, which give you 2x on, mm -hmm. you know, on every tile uh, and really nearly came out and, and wow. took the lead cool. because of that. It was And, and she, she saw that... Uh, you know that ability on the in the game on her own, so that That's was excellent. great to see. Again, my son, who's younger, at uh, wasn't quite as fast to pick up some of the tactics, but like similar to me with many games, he <laughs> wants to get back to the table because he wants to figure out something and figure out a way to do it better. Right? He knows right. he can play better now that he understands the game better, and he wants to try it again. So that's what you want, right? That's yeah. that's the goal, right? Absolutely. The, I want to go back and learn and do better. That is the the. What you want to instill in your kids when playing board games. Yep. It doesn't matter if you failed. You want to come back and try again. Absolutely. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, just a few things. Uh, Sean from Hamilton will be Sean in Windsor this weekend. Uh, we'll be finishing off our game of Big Trouble in Little China, Legacy of Lopan. Uh, we got two, I think we have two, two sections left Thank to finish. You, yep. Two time frames where you're traveling through time, trying to defeat Lopan. If I remember correctly, we just left the Old West, and I don't know where we're coming out. And I think we ended in prehistoric times, so I don't know what's going on. And we're possibly going to make that a six-player game. Sean Hamilton in Windsor, not Sean from Hamilton, who will also be in Windsor, will, uh, will possibly be joining us and getting a six-player going, just because I want to try the game with six players. We are going to live stream that, so for those of you here live, you can join us Friday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern. For those of you expecting Gloomhaven, sorry, this has been planned. We play Gloomhaven most of the time. Sometimes we play other stuff. I don't have enough days in the week to be able to split up our actual plays. Saturday, we should all be hitting up the CG Realm for the first game night of February. That's here in Windsor. 
corner of Hall and Cumsey Road come out between 5 and 10 p.m. I will be teaching some Imhotep A New Dynasty, the expansion for Imhotep with five new boards and 10,028 possible combinations. And I'm kind of hoping to get in a game of Horizons, too. We'll see if that happens. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll be down there for as much of it as I can. Uh, we should also probably, I was just thinking, uh, we, we are not going to be a long stream with that uh, uh, low pan finish up. So we might want to have something in our back pocket to, to pull out for a uh, post stream. Okay, maybe um, Goris Maximus, because I don't have a lot of six player to be played. Right. If we don't have Sean Hamilton, we can do Horizons then. Because right. Abtori and Cat know how to play already. But I mean, I, I'm just thinking, like, we're, with only two scenes left, that game plays pretty, pretty Yeah, quickly. but the second scene, I think we're doing the flip the board. Ah, uh, true. So I have a feeling if it's like the original game, that's another Could be, yeah. huge chunk of just, game. Just something to sort of keep in the back of our mind. We might want to, you know, yeah. have, a, have a backup. Although a short stream's never bad either. We could just play games after, too. True. <laughs> All right, week after that, this one matters for you, those of you listening at home. February's easy mode game night. I uh, did not pull up the date. It's the 15th. Is that right? Yes, oh, yeah, 15th. Yeah, probably, yeah. February 15th. We will be back at easy mode. Um, again, easy mode, video games, board games, all in one place. You want to play some uh, Super Smash Brothers, League of Legends, or uh, with that Fortnite thing that everyone seems to be digging, you're welcome to play that, or we'll have a bunch of board games there. I am planning on bringing out uh, Gorus Maximus. That's a big one I want to play. It's a trick-taking card game that plays eight players. There's not a lot of chances I have to get eight players in one place. Easy mode, it's the right kind of game. It's the right kind of atmosphere. People probably have a couple of drinks. Maybe someone will throw up looking at the artwork. You know, it should be a ton of fun. Um, and maybe, because now and then, we do get some heavier gamers out that night, depending on how the crowd's going. I may use that as a chance to get Orleone back out, but we'll see. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr. Thank you, David. And you rock for bumping up that pledge. Brian Kurtz. Thank you, Brian, even though you just missed this. We got we to move the Patreon shout out up just for Brian's sake. Like yeah. He always just misses it. It's like, oh, Brian's leaving. They must be getting near the end of the show. Yuho Rutila. Thank you. And welcome to new Tabletop Bellhop, patr Bellhop patrons. Colin Massey, thank you. And Kator. So I guess that's technically three, but they're they're only pay. I'm not making them both pay. They're, they're Kator. They they go together. Thank you both for being awesome. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end. We're gonna have to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. We got a little bit of a uh, unbox reveal. Yes. The Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.